Welcome to the party. I'm not here right now, but I want you to listen very carefully. So pay attention. Enough talk. It's showtime. So in this episode of Bags of Action, we are joined by a special guest, Andy Schmidt, formerly a comic book editor at Marvel and also IDW and also a comic writer. Uh, he also founded and runs Comics Experience, which is um, both uh, Steve and I are familiar with this, is an excellent place to learn about writing and drawing comics. And their website for Comics Experience is comicsexperience.com. So yeah, Andy Schmidt joins us to talk about... Islander. Hello and welcome to Bags of Action. My name's Steve, my co-host is Pete. Hello. This episode we have a special guest who's going to be talking with us about the 1986 film Highlander. It's Andy Schmidt. Hey everybody, how's it going? So this was your choice, Andy. So this is a favourite film of yours, I believe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. So... I think this was, it's not the first R-rated movie I saw, but it was one of them. I think the first R-rated movie I saw was Terminator, but uh, which I also like. But uh, yeah, this was one of the first ones, and I saw it like at home. It was on like HBO or something like that, and my parents didn't know I was watching it. And they walked in in the in the 22nd sex scene uh, <laughs> and, and turned it off, and, and, and I was like... I was like, no, you guys don't understand. This wasn't about me seeing boobs. This was about immortals chopping each other's heads off to get the prize. Like, I have That's to know better. This, That's so much better. <laughs> I have to know how this turned out. And, and, and that did not convince them that when I was you know, 10 years old or 11 years old or whatever, that I should, uh, I should be allowed to finish watching it. So then I went on a uh, kung fu-like quest to – to find out because I also didn't see the beginning of it. So I didn't even know what it was called. Ah. Um, so it took me a long time to find it and see the whole thing. But yeah, I have seen, I have seen this movie more times than I care to count. And, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, yeah. There are a few movies that I basically have memorized. There's Highlander, there's aliens, there's the original animated transformers. Mm -hmm. You know, there are a couple others, maybe lethal weapon one or two, <laughs> you know, oh, that's that kind impressive. Of well, Can I, I need to make a on, confession please. about this film. Go on. Is that I saw the sequel first. I'm surprised you came back. Yeah. I, I know. So, so, there's, I, so, so this is this is an important thing because Highlander is – Highlander is. I mean, and you guys know my background in, in franchises and entertainment and stuff. So, like, this is, a, is not just the movie itself, which I do enjoy, but, like, like, like studying Highlander as a, as a media – property is is fascinating so i'm of the ilk that like there's one movie and, and the rest i just don't care and it's yeah, like yeah. it's not that i have anything against them although i did see i think i've seen three of the other films and and i did not like them but the highlander just seemed like such a complete story that i never had any interest or need for more mm. um and the tv series i just never really got into but then you've got other people that are just like it's the TV series and nothing else matters. Um, you know, it's it's you know it's one of those things. But but what's really really fascinating is I think I saw I've seen Highlander one two three and four, which three and four aren't called three and four. But you know I just love that like Highlander two rewrites sort of the the whole mythology of the first one. Then Highlander three retcons Highlander 2 yep. out of continuity, and then Highlander 4, Endgame, retcons 3, and <laughs> like the last third of the first movie. So so I guess only two-thirds of this movie are left in continuity if you were actually trying to follow this, but trying to follow continuity, and this is just a mistake all around. Oh, yeah. It's a um, mess. It's a mess. But it's a ma yeah, it's a massive mess. So I, I am but surprised I, that Pete came back. But I, so I saw them in in order. But I don't think I've actually seen the the fourth one, Endgame. I've, I have. And no. Oh, it's terrible. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's that bad. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, not... I agree with Andy. So it does. This is a film which, you know, if it's something that people have been waiting for in a story for thousands of years, and it happens, yeah, there really is no need for anything else to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Endgame is as bad as three, and I mean, probably not as bad as two. 
And the thing, the thing that fascinates me about too is that it's the same director mm-hmm. yeah. that did it. Like, how, like, how do you make Highlander one and then make Highlander two and go, oh, that was a good idea? <laughs> like, I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't know how that. I don't know how that happened. But mm-hmm. as I don't know, Mr. Mulcahy, I probably will will never get the chance to ask, and I don't <laughs> care enough to try. Well, it's, um, it's, it's the same with me with the, the Matrix film. I saw the first Matrix film. I had everything I needed, and then I said we're going to do two more, and I thought. Why? Why? And I watched them and they gave me nothing. So for me, there's only one Matrix film and that's all I need. And it's a perfect story. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it, it's one of those interesting things where it's just, I, you know, I think people forget that they can ch- pick and choose. Like they don't have to. And it's sort of the whole idea of canon. Mm. Um, like there's, you know, this sort of debate. Like when, like, I mean, I got like pissed when, when Disney announced that they were throwing out all the extended universe stuff on on star wars and then i just realized and then like for like a day i was grumpy and then i was like wait a second why do i care what they say like i'm the one that gets to choose what aspects of this of star wars i enjoy and read and whatever else like yeah okay they can control what gets published through random house or whatever but or del rey i forget who it is now but uh but yeah it just sort of you know i just realized like wait a second i'm actually in control of what i consume and pay attention to and enjoy like it doesn't matter to me if they say this is or isn't canon like i don't and that means nothing to me at this point so yeah but that's just how that's just how i approach this stuff i have not always had this like laid back approach to canon (laughs) Uh, and certainly i wonder where that comes from (laughs) (laughs) well certainly yeah i mean you know the thing is is you know when i was uh, when I was an editor at Marvel, you know, canon and, and continuity was important, but consistency of the characters was more important. So we managed to get around a lot of stuff. But uh, but anytime we did get around stuff, you know, we got complained at, yelled at, mm-hmm. flogged publicly, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> well, but anyway, because there's three of us and yeah. you can now settle an argument between me and Pete about this film. Okay. How, do well, you, how does well, that work? Well, how is that democracy? Well, because I'm on one side and you're on the other, so Andy's going to have to decide okay. it. <laughs> right. Majority Casting rule. Votes. Okay. So, can you can you pronounce the name of the main star of the Highlander film? <laughs> Sean Connery. No. Yeah. Uh, uh, I've always said Christopher Lambert, but I don't know if that's right. Oh, damn! <laughs> you split the difference. You split the difference, and I, I was talking about this with people last night, and they did the same thing. They split the difference as well. Uh, well, I think technically his first name is actually Christoph. Christoph. Yeah, there's no R. There's no R. I'm looking. <laughs> there's no R. It doesn't exist. It's a figment. He's so Pete insists it's Christoph the R Lambert. is not the R is not canon. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think because I remember reading that. Um, like like movie posters in like in France and and other places they don't have the they don't have the R and I think I think that's his actual name hmm. is without the R but I don't know I mean I don't know this is the only this is the only watchable movie I think he's ever made uh, what about Fortress I stand by my previous <laughs> <It wasn't very laughs> quiet. what about Fortress uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know Gray, Greystoke is is all right. Yeah. Stoke is all right. Yeah, it's not bad. Well, he did Ghost Rider, I, apparently. I didn't know that. He, he did what? He was in Ghost Rider, Spirit of Vengeance in 2011, it says. Uh, yeah, I didn't uh, probably. I didn't see that, but probably it wasn't watchable. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's lots of things that, having watched it recently, that I've, I've forgotten. I mean, I, I remembered the whole story completely. Um, but there's all the little things that watching it fresh now in 2017 that really surprised me like not not just the awful bits like at the beginning when he's fighting the guy under madison square garden with the wrestling and the actor is this kind of middle-aged guy with a toupee <laughs> and yet when they're not fighting he's back flipping up and down and it's such a terrible cut <laughs> right so so that that actually is the perfect lead into what i really wanted to to, to talk about which is the difference between the uk version mm-hmm. or i guess really the the european version yeah. and what we got over here in the united states because 
they took a bunch of stuff out of the movie when they released it here in the United States. And I would say I agree wholeheartedly with almost every one of those decisions. Oh. And the ones and the ones that I don't agree wholeheartedly with are kind of like I could take it or leave it. Like there's a bunch of stuff where like the European version is a little bit more violent. Like when he's getting banished, he gets headbutted in the face like three times. Like okay, that doesn't happen in the American version, but like that doesn't really matter. Like you don't yeah. It's, uh, like you have to like really get into it to like to tell and and uh in the church scene in the European version, the Kurgan like licks the priest's hand. Yep. And and the licking part of that scene got cut, but the rest of the scene is there. And that's not like – like that doesn't change the story in any demonstrable way. It makes him a little bit weirder. But um, but the stuff that they cut that matters is uh, it, just in that opening, there's more stuff in that in that wrestling scene in, in, in your version where they start flashback – they do flashbacks to Scotland for like no reason at that point, which telegraphs too much. Um, it's much more interesting if that shows up later. Hmm. Um, and the see, the the fight with uh, Facil, that's how you say his name, by the way. Yeah, Facil, the middle aged guy <laughs> who, play, who who played a uh, who played a, a, a one of the Sand People in the original Star Wars. Um, there's some funny Star Wars connections to this movie, by the way. But anyway, but all the backflipping stuff that yeah. was never in the U.S. release, and so it's it's all this uh. like it's all this little stuff that makes this movie really stupid uh, that got cut out of the American release. So the American release is tonally much more um, consistent. Like it's it's a little darker, it's a little more grown up, and I mean it was funny because I was watching this last night on my iPad. Uh, and I was right at the the end scene where they're they're on top of the Silver Cup Studios and they're fighting in the water, mm-hmm. you know, right before they fall in. And um, and my wife comes in and she starts watching it like right at this scene, which is like the perfect time to come in where I get to explain like, oh yeah, so they're immortals. <laughs> and um, and she's like, what's with the electricity? I was like, oh well, that comes from the quickening. Like they they give off their own electricity, so that's totally normal. Like that's totally justified in this movie. <laughs> And she's like, right. Uh, but there's this little bit there, like they, they get separated briefly and the Kurgan does this little thing where he just like swirls around in the water and then like goes underneath it like really calmly yeah. um, and then pops back up. Not in the American release, but like my wife is watching it and she's kind of making fun of it because, you know, I'm just watching a dumb action movie. But then when that happens, she just audibly laughs out loud and just, like, makes fun of it. And it's those little things that just, like, completely take you out. Of, like, what is that? What was that supposed to be? It was just it was just dumb and it wouldn't work and it doesn't make any sense. And those are all these, like, little things that they cut, hmm. which makes the American release – I'm going to go on record here uh, as being much better. Now, there's there's one sort of – it's not an important scene. But there's one, you know, scene that is pretty interesting that um, that got cut, which is the flashback to World War II with with Rachel. Little, or Rachel, yeah. But the thing is, is that scene doesn't matter. Well, that scene doesn't matter. Does she not give the? There's no. It's a kind of magic without that scene, though. Yeah. So he just in the American release when he when he's when he tells her that Russell Nash dies tonight, he does tell her. That it's a that it's a kind of magic. Which then it just uh, feels like he's reading out the lyric sheet at that point. <laughs> well, well, the interesting thing about that scene is that that is the is a World War II scene was not in the original screenplay and wasn't shot. That that was reshot uh, after the fact, which is why it looks so different. Which is part of the reason why it should have been cut because um, he because Mulcahy shot it with his uh, like his music video crew. Mm. Um, and so and so it was just thrown together. But the whole reason that that scene exists is to explain him saying, hey, it's a it's a kind of magic. But again, the relationship with Rachel, hmm. I think, works a lot better if you don't know exactly how they like she's clearly very loyal. There's they clearly are very affectionate towards one another. But what exactly is that relationship? Was she a former lover? Was she not like when you don't know exactly that that she's basically kind of like a, a daughter to him mm. when you don't know that that relationship is much more interesting and uh the actress i think that plays rachel i think does a really nice job of sort of walking this this um this 
this line with it. Sheila Gish was her name, by the way. I don't um, know, because without that scene, if, if she was a former lover, it's a bit creepy to see for her to see him then going and seducing someone. She knows all his moves and watching him do it to someone else whilst she's still there. And yet she's been cast off because she's old after what happened with Heather. I would think that would be a bit freaky and a bit disturbing. Whereas because you get the flashback, it's like, yeah, you're too old now. I had a, I had a wife. She got really old and she died on me. So I'm not doing that again. Now that There's you're a- in your 50s, you can sit there and watch me seduce this other woman and help me buy her a nice bottle of wine. And well, it's like, that's not really cool. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I mean, that's not how I would look at it, though. You know, with with uh, with Heather, the the woman that he loves, you mm-hmm. know, and then she and then she disappears. And he he learns a pretty harsh lesson there, which was exactly the lesson that that uh, Ramirez was trying to teach him. And so it's very clear that he he doesn't fall in love with people after that. And so what's interesting about Rachel, when you don't know exactly what the relationship is, is this is the only person on the planet that he has any feelings for, but he will refuse to love her. And so when you don't know what that relationship is exactly, it doesn't have to be creepy. It doesn't have to be former lover. But when you just don't know what it is, it makes it interesting because you, you wind up wondering, what is it about her? What is it about this relationship that's so special and is he keeping his distance from her? Like, I do think it's pretty clear that they weren't lovers, even without that scene, which think, would be creep, which would be creepier if if they were lovers yes. after be, that scene. It would be Captain America creepy. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, it's, I think it's hard, isn't it? When I guess I've only ever seen it with that scene in it. And I do like the way that the two scenes link together. So... I think it works better with, but I've never watched it without. So mm. I shall sit on the fence a little bit. The creepiest thing in this film for me is the fact that he finds out what happened to Heather in the church and goes straight and has sex with the other woman while they play the theme music from his wife dying. Mm. Yeah. that That's the bit that I found creepy, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if, well, go on. No, no, you go ahead, Steve. I was going to say things that should be cut, though. Saying about silly things, if they've so from what you said about the cuts, it sounds like the American version is is a lot more tonally serious and and things. And for me, the one bit that sticks out that really makes it just doesn't work. And the Kurgan, is, you know, he's from the the steps. He's from the Russian steps, so he's big and he's mean and he's scary. And then there's all the fun stuff that he does that shows you that he's a psychopath and. Um, Rachel says killing killing everyone has driven him mad. So you think he's just lost his marbles. And yet there's the funny bit where he, he kidnaps the old woman in the car and calls her mother, which makes me laugh every single time. But the bit in the church doesn't work when he says, I have something to say. I, I hate that bit. It makes me cringe. I just, I just hate, yeah, I don't know. I hate that, the, what he's done to Heather as a plot point. It's just, it's an overused way to make men angry. It's one of the um, refrigerators, really. Yeah, and it's it's not. I don't think it's really needed because yeah, you, it, almost, it, it, you guess it happened anyway, but you don't need him to be told. It doesn't make any difference to how he's going to ch- cut his head off. Yeah, regardless. Yeah, I don't think that that particular like reveal to um, uh, to to McLeod works. Like it, like it's a it's supposed to make the audience go. Oh shit! It's on now, mm. but it doesn't really work because every time I've watched that movie, I've always assumed that he knew what happened because you know his friend get, was murdered there and the house was torn down. Yeah, you know, I just always kind of assumed like he got the whole story, and so I wind up hitting the wrong beat there. I'm like, wait, what? He didn't know? Mm. Well, that's weird. Like, how does that work? <laughs> you know, so so that. That little reveal, I like the church scene as a whole, but I don't think that that reveal there works. Uh, you know, and not only does it fall into that trope, but it also falls into the trope of he then he then decides he's going to love Brenda, and I'm not really sure what she did specifically to earn that love. Mm. Um, she wrote a book and, that you and, like <laughs> and then, about swords. Uh, she, you like swords? She did write a she did write a, book, a cool book about swords. Yeah. Um, but then, but then, you know, she is then immediately turned into 
held captive and uh you know he's got to go rescue her which is which is you know not good but in the 80s uh yeah, you know true. yeah uh, well, all, all the men filmmakers didn't realize that that wasn't good yet so i think uh, which is not past but but it but but i don't I, I think if they were making that film now they there would there would be an effort to avoid you know just making her the damsel in distress at the end at least i, I hope think- I think as well, once it's down to just the two of them, and they've said about 40 times there can be only one, yep. she doesn't even need to be kidnapped. And, he, and it's, she's not really, it doesn't seem like she's in that much peril. But also, did you notice, Steve, because we've talked about one of Russell Mulcahy's other films before, Ricochet, yeah. which is a very similar ending. <laughs> What, a fight with a fight in is the it? warehouse. Fight, which is a fight up on top of it. It's on a... It's, on, a, it's on an antenna, right? Yeah. yeah. Of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. But just sticking on that on that point and the whole kind of captured woman thing, the the interesting <laughs> thing is that he ties her up on the silver cup thing and then basically forgets her and they're fighting and the, the the sign falls over and she's dangling and she rescues herself and then if she hadn't been kidnapped, here's the irony: if the Kurgan had dead. kidnapped yeah. her, McLeod would be dead because she saves McLeod by hitting the Kurgan true. with a pipe. So it's that, that weird thing of even though it's women in refrigerators to motivate him to go and do it, even though he's going to have to do it anyway because there'd be only one. If she hadn't been there, the Kurgan would have won. So it's, Steve, Steve, yeah. Steve, I think you missed the point. I think you missed the point. It's the fact that he finally fell in love. It's love that saves the day. <laughs> of see? course it is. Because Not a see? sword. <laughs> Yeah, also, but ironic, also, ironically, also, by the way, it, it uh, I want you to know, having lived in New York City, that yeah. um, <laughs> you do find random steel pipes the length of swords everywhere wow. <laughs> to beat people up with. Yeah, that's like yeah. that's like a known thing amongst New Yorkers. Mm. Mm-hmm. Not really. No, not really. Well, Pete. No, I was just going to say, I think it's the irony of that there's so much about uh, there can be only one. But when it comes to falling in love, he realizes there can be two. Well, a lot, because... Uh, a lot, that's true. Whether if he's in love with the others. The thing about the Second World War scene that I like is that without that one, and without the, the scene of him and his famous duel on the common, you'd only assume that he'd lived Just the one Scotland. life in yeah, Scotland. Yeah, yeah. Whereas you see him as a bit more worldly. You see him fighting on the on the, the duel and getting stabbed lots of times. Which and is, it explains uh, his accent, because he says he's travelled around the world. That's why he's got such an amalgam of an accent. And Yeah, that's and... that's why when he says lots of different places, <laughs> he, sounds, he sounds so weird. And so of course, like you're called Van Damme having a stroke. Yeah, and just like uh, Sean Connery says, I'm Egyptian, you Spanish peacock, and all that kind of stuff. It's just, yeah, because obviously he's Egyptian, what's and a, yet he's what's lived... What's a haggis? A haggis, I'm well, disgusting. The, the, the casting of this movie is... <laughs> Is maybe the most genius thing about it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I like I like the Second World War thing because it shows that what he's done and and the Rachel thing. I like the fact that we get to see the duel. But it's more interesting than just he was a Highlander and after that now he's a, an antique dealer. Wow, that's so dull. <laughs> was um was the duel scene in the American version, Andy? The, uh, On the yeah, common. the duel scene is uh, okay. it ends a little earlier than it does in your version. So in your version, it ends with um, with the guy shooting. Yes, the, uh, the other guy there. That yeah. doesn't happen. That didn't happen in the American version. It, he just he just walks off, and it has that shot where the guy like jerks his head to one side, and then that's that's the end of it. I think you know they cut out these little brief bits of violence, but it was interesting because I watched, I watched the last half of it last night at the American version, mm. um, which by the way, you can't get on Blu-ray or DVD or anything like, like you still have to own the old VHS tape to get it uh, or, or the laser disc. Um, they haven't released it in like third 20, I guess 20 years now. Um, it hasn't been available, but anyway, uh, but then, but then I turned around and watched that same, you know, hour of the, of the of the European version and and uh, and I like there was a lot of like that little stuff that I had kind of forgotten was was different, um, but yeah. So I'd like to point out something else. Go on. Which is uh, one of the all time best pickup lines uh, is from Star Wars, which is I'm here with Ben Kenobi, and she said Ben Kenobi. So clearly this is a, this is a great pickup line, right? But this movie has your backup pickup line. If the Ben Kenobi thing doesn't work and the girl doesn't come with you, Mm -hmm. then I've found that if I just pull out a dagger and place it in front of my chest, (laughs) 
and say, I'm Connor McLeod Cloud of the Clan McLeod. I was born in 1518 in the village of Glenfinnan on the shores of Loch Shiel, and I am immortal. And then I plunge the dagger into my chest and collapse dead on the floor and then get back up. That wins every time. That is in a Scot- winner. In Scotland, that's called foreplay. <laughs> <laughs> But that is what that that scene I always find like, and I and you know you kind of have to hand this to to uh, to Roxanne Hart because the <laughs> can you, I mean the idea that you read that script and you're like okay so that happens mm-hmm. and then I fall to my knees with him because like he's falling dead so like okay I drop down because like maybe I'm gonna try and catch him mm-hmm. see if he's okay. And then he's bleeding out of his gut, drops a dagger on the floor, and then I kiss him. Like, the idea that that somehow produces this love-slash-sexual response is pretty bizarre and weird to me. So I'm pretty sure there's some, for however long they're together, there is some kinky shit going on. (laughs) We already know that the Kurgan's a weirdo because when Candy comes in uh, to see him, and then later on, the guy <laughs> said, uh, "Candy said you like some weird stuff." I was like, "What are these? What are these immortals up to?" It kind of well, boggles I, the mind. I think when she walks in, she goes, "I'm Candy," and he just goes, "Of, of course, course you are." You are. <laughs> it's like, oh dear. Yeah, yeah. Were, were we supposed to think he ate her? I don't like know. he's a I cannibal. Think, I, I think there's a body somewhere in that motel in the wall, you know. And when they come to knock it down and turn it into some high rise b- bunch of flats, they'll find Candy's skeleton with I don't know, God knows what done to her. Uh, so I don't. Sorry, I was going to say yeah. is that because we just mentioned a minute ago about um, you know what the how they end up kind of getting together, but a similar scene for me in terms of its incredulousness. Or in, that's not a word. Uh, <laughs> That's the word I can't say. Uh, was the computer guy with his green text? And oh, his... I love that! Why doesn't he say this? These people all have very similar handwriting. He goes, "Do you know what you're dealing with? You're dealing with a t- with someone who's immortal or a time traveler." It, with that, he doesn't even bat an eyelid. Well, uh, by... <laughs> okay. So first of all, it's because it's a movie, and so we want to see that the handwriting. It goes up, but that's just that's just you know me being a media guy. But uh, but my favorite part about that is that the computer can instantly grab like multiple versions of letters and pull them down. Mm-hmm. But when it comes and and squashes the name Russell Nash together, but when it actually tries to then locate the other Russell Nash on the screen, it gets really confused. <laughs> it like goes up and like misses it and goes too far. And then it goes oh too far to the left. Oh back this way. Wait oh oh and then it drops down into place. Uh, that to me is the world's dumbest computer. I mean the technology in this film is fantastic. There's a line printer when she's printing out the composition of the metal, and and the computers are enormous and the keyboards are giant. And I don't think they've even got mice at this point on computers i think it's just keyboard it's it's so archaic and yet it's not that long ago relatively <laughs> yeah i mean i remember uh, not that long ago i was watching um the first pierce brosnan james bond movie mm. uh golden eye and like he walks into this the high-tech you know place whatever there are like 12 of them in that movie but he walks into like one of them and they've got these monitors that are like two feet deep, but I'm like, well, it doesn't look very high tech at all. Uh, <laughs> those aren't even touch screens. What's touch going screen. on? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. And, you know, my kids were born um, uh, 10 and six years ago. And like the first time that my son like walked into a, somebody's house and they had a, they were playing video games. He just walked up to the screen and started trying to manipulate it with his, finger like right when he started to walk i'm like "Mm, yeah that's a little different from me like that just wouldn't have occurred to me but i mean we're we're kind of we we launched into some of the ridiculousness of this film and there's 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 certainly plenty Mm -hmm. but i do think it's worth pointing out in a little in defense of the movie is it there is some underlying and I think parts of the execution one of the point i was trying to get to with with kind of handing it to roxanne hart for that for that strange transition from dead guy to lover is that she actually sells that. Mm. Like I, I kind of buy it. 
which is which is which is kind of, which is impressive because there's no way that I should. But but she sells it, I think. And uh, but there's underlying stuff here that I think is really really cool, really fascinating. The whole I and 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 the world is fairly well realized in that you know they've got their they've got their rules and and the, the parameters of how this work works is set up. It's not set up in the se- and and the best part is you know that they don't fight on holy ground they will feel this call and they will bow to the last for the prize that's all you need yeah uh, and then everything else every other question like well, why are these guys immortal or wherever like all of that is just summed up in hey it's a kind of magic which is what I love about this one and is what destroys the second one the thing that destroys the second one isn't that it goes off into the future there's aliens a shield and stuff. Earth. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's this it's this need to try and explain stuff that should never be explained and so, if, if michael if michael ironside can't save your movie no one can it's true it is true <laughs> look at starship troopers without him that film was a flop um so hang on, i'm curious so in the american version at the very beginning is there the voiceover from sean connery there is, yeah. So that see, so you were saying that if they didn't have other things, it kind of gives the film away, and the the, the very the, the bit at the start in the garden and flashbacks. I think if I was going to redo the film now and recut it, and I had the American version to start, I would take out that voiceover thing at the beginning because you make it more of a mystery then that you don't know who this guy is, you don't know why they're going around chopping heads, and you're more in line with the police. You're more thinking, hang on, he's just a maniac, and as things start to go on. And then you get the flashbacks, you realise there's something more, to the point where when Sean Connery turns up, he then explains everything that we've already had because he told us in the voiceover at the start of the bloody film. So unless you've forgotten that first 30 seconds, you kind of know what's coming in this film, which on the first viewing, I had no clue. I've obviously, I was absorbed by it. But now I go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Down, down, dawn of time. Yeah. Fight to the last. Yep. Yeah, gathering. Okay. And then we get told three or four times, the gathering, the gathering, the quickening, the gathering. And it goes on and on and on. It, the, the intro bit does feel like it may have been added. Extra. Extra. Yeah, I, th- I think it was. Um, and, you know, a lot of films do this and, and they get added in later too. I know Dark City was like that. The producers made them put the opening narration or voiceover or whatever in the beginning of dark city. And, and Roger Ebert makes exactly that same point. It's like, well, that just kills all of the drama out of the first, you know, two hours of that two hour movie. Um, because it's just all explained. And in Highlander, I don't think it's quite that egregious because he doesn't get into specifics. Like he doesn't name Connor McLeod. He doesn't even name himself. I mean, no. you recognize his voice. So, so there's still enough mystery, you know, for me, but to be fair, like I said, the first time I saw this movie, I didn't see the beginning of it. So <laughs> I didn't know, that. but you know, kind of, I don't know. I just think there's something brilliant to this. I think it, it, it actually, and one of the things that I, that I really do love about this movie is that it's, it's a movie that isn't just an action movie. It does actually attempt to sort of talk about real themes and stuff. And, and the fact that these guys are immortal, it comes up like it, like they use that for dramatic effect. And, and if it's not an actor or an actress selling it and Christopher Lambert or, Christoph Lambert, <laughs> whatever you want to call him, if he's not the one selling it, because he doesn't sell a whole lot in this movie, um, <gasps> if he's not the one selling it, you know they they put decent people a- around him that do, and even when they don't, they don't have to because Queen's got you covered. That's mm. true, and it, Steve will know this. In other episodes, I've complained about on the nose lyrics that are yeah. basically someone singing the story. This is one of the notable exceptions where I don't have a problem with it because. I think it enhances the film massively. It's, if you if your heart doesn't break when uh, when they sing um, "Who Wants to Live Forever," yep. then you are made of stone. Mm. I mean, <laughs> true. This, this uh, yeah. film's got uh, some of the cast is is a little bit mm, suspect, but I'd forgotten about some of the other people. So Alan um, North, yeah, and um, but also like James Cosmo. Thereafter, mm-hmm. he became the Scotsman in every film. Yeah. Right through from Braveheart, now he's in Game of Thrones. He's um, just been in Wonder Woman as well. Yeah. Not Scottish, though. So. Ah, you've got Celia Emery, Emery, which is very bizarre seeing her as the girlfriend at the beginning of the film, yeah. compared to what we've seen her in the last 30 years on British TV. It's so out of character for her, it's ridiculous. Um, and Clancy Brown, I think this is the first film that I ever saw him in. 
that set him on the path of being a villain in absolutely in, everything in everything. ever. Yeah. Apart from one TV thing that he did. And do you know what that was? No. So he was in ER and he was a love interest for one of the main characters. And it freaked the shit out of me. I was convinced. <laughs> well, yeah, because you're like, no, don't don't go with him. He's going to knock your house down. Yeah. He's going <laughs> to chop your head murder off. Murder your boyfriend. He's going to do all and sorts of prostitutes. Mentor. He's going to do everything. And then, and then it turns out that he was just a nice guy having a relationship with this doctor. I, I wasn't convinced. I was waiting for the kind of Hannibal moment where he opens a cupboard or he opens his briefcase and it's just full of human livers. And yet they never quite got to it. I don't know why. Maybe it was cancelled. But just, I have yeah. a similar thing in reverse in this film now because yeah. I'd forgotten that Alan North is in it. Mm-hmm. And whenever I see Alan North as a as a policeman, yep. I straight away think of... Um, Hear no evil, see no evil. Ah. So I was waiting for Fuzzy Wuzzy was a woman, but that didn't happen. <laughs> I love that. I love that. But well, one of one of my favorite things is that uh, Castigier, the guy that thinks they should have a party, yes, uh, yeah, is, in, is, is in is in the uh, is in the Phantom Menace, and he is is, 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 is a, and is in Attack of the Clones, and probably in Revenge of the Sith. And he's one. also in a long running British uh, hospital soap called Holby City. Is he in that? Oh. Yeah. Oh wow. Has been for a long time. Yeah. Is he the guy on the desk? No, that's in Casualty. No, he's in Holby no. as the... Uh, he's uh, a s- Rick Griffin is the name of a doctor that he plays. Oh, okay. I don't watch it, so yeah. I was vaguely aware yeah, of the and, show. And, and John Polito is like an amazing character actor. I mean, mm. he's he's phenomenal in a bunch of stuff, especially like Miller's Crossing. He's yeah. turns into a tremendous performance in, in, that, in that film. Um, he... Yeah, this is all very strange. This movie is just so strange because, like, you you kind of look at all of these elements that in and of themselves, like, in a vacuum, you're like, oh, I can see how this works. I can see how that works. I can see how this other thing works. But then when you decide to put sword fighting immortals, yep. Queen, Sean Connery, and, like, all of this stuff together, I'm like, this – doesn't make any sense. This shouldn't work, and yet every piece of it kind of does. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a, do you know why, Andy? It's a no. kind of magic. <laughs> That's why. Wow, you nailed, it. you nailed that. Drops mic goes. Just, just end the end the episode That's it, right yeah. there. But, it's, yeah, but right. I, I know what you mean. When I rewatched it, because you know, quite often these things, you think, oh yeah, I can understand where the decision making process was, or I can imagine where I would have come up with this idea, or I'd have done this thing. Mm. This is a film I was like, I have no idea. I I can't imagine how all these elements, right, and, were ever and, gonna thought of. Yeah, and if you look at Mulcahy's other films, he clearly made them under the same "I don't make clear decisions" uh, sort of, th- and they don't work. Like none of these movies work. Ricochet probably comes the closest, but even it. Isn't all that great, and yet for some reason the melting pot of things that don't fit together work really well here. Yeah, they did. Mm. I agree. It's it's totally random that, as you say, just this very 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 different elements that this shouldn't work. So I hadn't watched this film for quite a long time, and as, as we've talked about on the podcast many times, we come back to some of the older action films, and some of them hold up, and some of them don't, and you cringe at bits. And some things are so bad, they're good. And then other things hold up. Now, some of the CGI on this is obviously wonky towards the end, and it does look very dated. I don't, I don't even think it's CGI. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, I well, agree. Well, whatever. whatever it's whatever it's hand fact. animation. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's very, very poor. And, you know, the computers and all this kind of stuff doesn't age. But despite all these random elements, and despite the unusual casting, especially of the lead and Sean Connery, yeah. It does work, and it still holds up. I was I was never bored watching this film, uh, and it's got a runtime of nearly two hours. It yeah. did not feel like it. I mean, all the time now, I listen to a film critic, and he says, modern films are too long, blah, blah, blah. I should cut half an hour, all of them, blah, blah. I never felt that with this. I never thought, yeah, you could cut half an hour, and it would be better. I think it's actually got more charming with age. In some in some ways it has. I mean, it's it's interesting because I've I've really enjoyed this movie from the time that I was about twelve years old, and now I'm I'm forty, 
And 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 there's never been a point in my life where I didn't like this movie. I've liked it for different reasons, probably. Like like when I'm younger, like yeah, like the sword fighting and the and the quickening and all that sort of stuff like was super cool. And that stuff's still fine. But now like I'm you know, as an adult, there's still stuff in this movie for me. Like there's there's the you know, I'm more interested in kind of his relationships with the people that that are around him and how he evolved and how he sort of came to be this guy with an accent that doesn't fit anywhere. And, <laughs> and Hey, you know, and I and like, and I love that they just like cover that early in the movie. Like clearly, I mean, you know, when I was reading up on the movie, like they didn't know when they cast him that he didn't speak English, <laughs> which is again, one of those things you look at and you're like, how did that decision happen? That makes no sense. I can't see how you got there. And yet it works because in that interrogation scene, one of the first times he's talking and you're like, what's up with this dude's accent? You talk funny, they co- Nash. <laughs> right, they cover it. And and that's all they had to do. If they had gone and in, launched into some you know, longer explanation about yeah. where he's traveled and all that sort of stuff, it wouldn't work. If he just says lots of different places, you're just like, yeah, there. Mm. Suck it, guy. You know, like... <laughs> It was. We were talking about this in the pub last night, and as first we say, because there's, apparently there is a remake in the works, or there has been for quite some time, and they're saying it will probably be cast now with a Scottish lead, if they keep the same basic story, yeah. possibly an Egyptian actor or or not uh, in the Ramirez role, but it actually won't be as good. It must by doing things properly in a way or more authentically probably won't work as well because in a way some of those kind of lopsided decisions are part of what makes this film so different what they'll do is they'll put someone who's either english or scottish or irish they'll put like michael fassbender in the main role they'll put someone like oded fair and go eh, he's not egyptian but it's close enough it's like alan voslu were in the mummy he's not egyptian eh, it'll do he's, he looks kind of from there and that's all they'll do that's because they'll go he can do an english accent and yeah he looks like he's not from around here yeah Brilliant. Go with that. Okay, okay, but am I the only one of the three of us that has zero interest in the Highlander remake? No, no, I definitely don't no, want to see not, it. No. I, I, as a rule... It's, 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 yeah, Point Break, Roadhouse, this is one of the other ones that uh, uh, more than happy for... Although Roadhouse apparently is... That's been canned. Good. Uh, I was going to say, I didn't even know that they were making a remake of that with, one. With uh, Ronda Rousey make as a female version. Mm-hmm. Huh. We said if they were going to do it, do it as a continuation with a nod and say she was his daughter. Otherwise, d- just you know, don't piss on well, the original. Although I've seen the sequel, the, which is where it's his nephew, so, and I would say do not watch that film. <laughs> I will not. I will not. But so... But, but 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 the reason I have no... Like, I have no interest in a... In a, in a re- I, I mean, I'm not saying that they can't or shouldn't make it like i don't care if they make one because again i go back to like well i'm just going to choose not to see it and i chose not to watch most of the other stuff or not to care after i did yeah i mean this movie to me just it's still so good like it doesn't it doesn't need a remake i felt that way when the lethal weapon tv show like came on like lethal weapon one and two are just still great yes like i don't need I don't need to do that. And they're probably the only two movies. Well, now I can watch the road warrior. The two of those on the road warrior I can watch. They're the only, they're the only Mel Gibson movies I can watch without being taken out of it because of all the baggage that comes with him now. But, yeah. and I still get taken out of them a little, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. Like in there's... general, I just, I, I'm against 99.9% of them. It has to be something spectacular. It has to be something different. Like when they said they were going to remake, it's not a film, but when they were going to remake Battlestar Galactica, I thought, no, yeah. don't do it. The original wasn't absolutely brilliant, but it was good. And then when they're doing a remake, I thought this is going to be an absolute car crash. And I was proven wrong. I love the new Battlestar Galactica, but that it's like, it's the exception to the rule. For every one of them, you get... Hmm, let's see. Uh, Total Recall, Footloose, um, name the other Arnie one that they did. Well, it was think, horrific. Well, I think the thing is, is that, is that, that, that I think that's true of like, of like just movies that they put out in general. Like most movies that they get put out are, are crap. Mm-hmm. So most remakes are going to be crap because they're oh, movies. Um, you know, I mean, and I'm not even saying that they can't do a good remake of this. Like you could. Um, but I don't know. I guess I, you know. I guess it probably just has more to do with my age and the fact that I saw this as a kid and I've liked it for so long that it's just like. But 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 this is one of those things where like, if you you tell me that they're going to make more Mad Max movies and I'm like, yeah, let's do it. 
there's there's more to that world I want to explore. Yeah. And there's really nothing more I want to explore. I don't have any questions uh, coming out of this that that I feel like I want to explore deeper. And in fact, there are ones that I specifically don't want to explore more yeah. deeply. You know, a lot of horror films kind of go into this. Like I loved the original Candyman, but then Candyman Two tried to explain the origin of the Candyman and show you all this stuff. And I was like, wow, he's a lot less interesting than I thought he was when I didn't know what had happened. I've got two you words know. for you. Darth Vader. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, why? Now, now, whenever I picture Vader, I don't picture him as the most menacing, terrifying, dark lord of the Empire. I picture him as a whiny boy crying about his mother. Boo-hoo. Well, well yeah, I mean, that... It, that's just so that's just so poorly executed and i was so i was so ecstatic when they announced that um i'm blanking on his name now the guy that was going to write episode seven but then wound up not he's in the credits but um gosh what's his name uh they wrote toy story three anyway i'm blanking on his name but i was excited when he was going to write it because when i saw toy story three uh, not only did i love that movie uh and it's really the only toy story movie that i really like ditto no same that I came out of that movie and I thought, oh, that like three minute sequence where they explained Lotso Huggin Bear's like origin and why he's so mean mm. was was what Darth Vader's origin should have been. That if you watch that and you think, is there a Darth Vader version of this that that was three minutes long that would have worked? The answer <laughs> is yes. That if if that the you can just erase those three prequels and like slot in Lotso's origin story. And it's much more effective. It's much more emotional. It, it has so much more resonance and it explain it would explain everything about Darth Vader in three minutes. Um, and it would have saved all that pain that those movies have caused. Mm. But now I live in a world where there's only one star Wars prequel and it's called rogue one. <laughs> <laughs> This is true. Although there's soon going to be a, a slightly damaged version of uh, Han Solo uh, prequel film. Oh, it's Ron Howard. Yes, Ron is now mm-hmm. directing. Oh, is that is that has that been confirmed? I knew yeah. he was. Uh, yeah, right. Hollywood Reporter. Yeah, confirmed today. But they're saying that he's only got like three weeks left of of shooting to do. So it's it's not quite as severe as the JLA thing with Joss Whedon jumping on. But it's kind of they're nearly done. So they get, they get someone who's steady and reliable and won't rock the boat and can settle things down. And Ron's going to come in and finish up by the sounds of it. So yeah, but they, but they did the same thing with row one. Garth Edwards was, or Edwards. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, Garth Garth Edwards, Edwards. Yeah. I mean, he was, he was completely sidelined and Tony Gilroy and, um, the second unit director, like basically reshot the whole thing. They brought in a new editor and I mean, they rewrote and rescripted that and reshot like that, I don't know how much, but it was a, apparently, from what I understand, it was a lot. Mm. Um, and it turned out all right. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I like Rogue One quite a bit. Me too. Mm, me three. Me three. Anyway, coming yeah. back to Highlander, nice. I want to yes. talk about some of the comedy things that made me laugh this time around. I'd forgotten. Right. So there's there's the bit with the street seller who's got the newspaper uh, and he's talking to the cops and he says, he says to them, what does <laughs> incompetent mean? <laughs> and the cops are having a conversation just ignoring him. What does baffled mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like I like that guy too. It, but you know what was funny? Because I told you I, I watched this, uh, the last half of this movie twice yeah. last night. So the first time I watched it and that scene's in there, and I'm like, oh, yeah, it's a scene with incompetent and baffled mean. And, <laughs> and, and then the second time I watched it, I realized that that scene doesn't serve any purpose. Because the only thing the cop says in that scene is that the mayor called him in the middle of the night and he doesn't answer his phone anymore. <laughs> it has nothing to do with anything. They're not talking – they're not – Seemingly, they're not talking about the case. There's no information that we get other than the cops, according to the newspaper, are both incompetent and baffled. <laughs> and that's it. That's all that scene is. And yet, I wouldn't take that scene out either. No, yeah. no. And there's that in the gun nut, which I've completely forgotten. He's driving around this super uh, the car. The Punisher. Yes, the Punisher. I love that guy. He's... He sells it again. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like that's a terrible idea. Uh-huh. <laughs> and yet... <laughs> <laughs> that guy sells it when he's all come on come on come on come on like i'm like yeah, this yeah, yeah. that like that wasn't an actor they just that guy was just there <laughs> they, they, they went to a conspiracy theory was, chat room it was ted nugent <laughs> and they got that him to guy, come in that guy sells it and and there's yeah, and there's yeah. 
there's a there's a good choice, uh, another good choice that makes that scene work in when he gets interviewed by the cops after being stabbed. Yeah. Yes, when in they, hospital. They cut, when they cut away, because if you'd heard what he said, you would have been just like, that guy's a dumbass. Yeah, yeah. But when they cut away like that and the music pops up and then the cops walk away and they're like, well, I don't want to talk about anybody glowing in the dark. Like – it works so much better that way than if they tried to shot that, tried to shoot that in the traditional way. And probably they did shoot that in the traditional way. And they were like, this does not work. We're going to take the sound out mm. and <laughs> we're going to do something else. But, but man, it just worked so much better that way. And that, and those are those like little things that make that, that make yeah, that work. And Michael came in score for this movie, which incorporates, you know, a lot of the a lot of the music from, from queen, but, there are moments where that score is really creepy. That little, I don't know what it is that he does, but the, I don't know what it is, but anyway, what, whatever it is that he does, uh, like in the, we were talking about the computer lab scene where they put together the signatures, but the music in that scene again, makes that work. And it's the same sort of music that makes the scene work with the doctor that that's like, yeah, he died after half a minute. Um, you know, I mean, it, it just, all of those things that, that, that seem like they're just like, you know, those are just, those are just info dump scenes and yet they're done in a way that makes them, that makes them work. Like I love that. Like even that, that, that shot that opens the scene with the computer nerd, the most stereotypical computer nerd ever put on film, by the way. Uh, And it's this high shot looking down, like over the walls. Like, I don't know where you went to find that, that yeah. place but you're like three stories up looking down on an office like i don't know where that is but or if they no, built it i don't know I think, but but it works so well yeah i think the shot choice is in this because this was around the time when a lot of music video directors were kind of breaking out into films with mixed results and i think it became almost like how they used to say comic book movie before there were lots of comic book movies they used to say like oh it's a music video it feels like a music video it was like a real insult of kind of style over substance but it's the music video bits of this film that make it – I absolutely adore the transitions in this film. The way they go Transitions between, are brilliant. Yeah. The, the, um, the fish in the, gold, in the tank that yeah. then becomes the water, every single one is different. And yeah. it's just – but, yeah, the, the shot choices, they're not what most directors would do, which I think is one of the things that makes it so interesting yeah. to watch. One of the scenes from from a from a shot choice and an editing standpoint that I think is is really really interesting is when and and, and this includes sound editing is the scene after the Kurgan goes into um, goes into Brenda's apartment and and snags her the car scene oh oh uh, yeah 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 is kind of brilliant in a way it's... I mean some of those shots were like you only see like her eye and like the and her part of her forehead and the rest is cropped out. It's so awkward and disjoining and the lighting in it. And, and when, you know, she's screaming and yet you're seeing him. And so it's her scream when he's doing that, like a lot of the, the stuff going on there. And then when he, when he kills the two pedestrians and, the, and there's that weird, like strobe effect, yes. like who thinks of that shouldn't work totally does like and, it, and that's what i feel like the, like this whole movie yeah. is sh- who thinks of this shouldn't work totally does. does but even another car scene actually at the start when he um races out of the um car park in his convertible yeah the the shot choice there is just it's it's quite ahead of its time mm-hmm. um the way it kind of tracks him around it's yeah it's uh, i don't think i'd appreciate it until rewatching it now quite how bold um, the stylistic choices are, but not in a but not in a way that it doesn't feel thrown together. They feel like they're all decisions that are made for a reason. There's a weird, and yet I can't figure out what those reasons. Well, are. No, that, yeah. that's also true. <laughs> There's a weird, almost accidentally comedic bit with that kind of thing where he's got Brenda in the car and he's kidnapped her and he's playing chicken, and he's you know there's all the funny bits where he's driving with no hands and looking at her. And he obviously doesn't care because he'll just get up and she'll die. But towards the end of it, once the Queen music gets pumped up and they start playing New York, New York, it it looks like a moment where it's almost like he's a local taking her on a tour guide of New York because he's pointing out the window at something. Like he's going, hey, look, there's the Silver Cup Studios. Let's go over there. If you weren't paying attention, be like, 
Wait, um, is he taking on a driving tour of New York? Is that what he's doing? And that that always, I always misstep every time because every time I watch it, the same thing happens. I'm like, oh, it's a bit annoying because they're playing a different piece of music and he's singing that, and it's really annoying. And hang on, Freddie Mercury's now singing a duet with him. Yep. And it's beautiful <laughs> yeah. how that comes together. Also, who thinks of that? <laughs> Shouldn't work. Totally does. does so, say, totally what is does. what is Silver Cup Studios? Because I I don't really know. Is it a big? Was it a big like film studio? No, band, actually, or? I used to I used to go past Silver Cup Studios every day when I lived in lived in Queens. It was originally a, I think a bread maker or something like that. Right. And then and then they went out of business, and then it was bought as a like a production house. So like it was just like a studio space that that you could rent in new york uh, okay. and produce your stuff so i don't know if that's still what it is but that's what it was for a number of a number of years but yeah but yeah it's just this just giant silver cup sign that nobody really knows what it's about or what it's for um and then they tore it down in the movie i think it's just, still there in life i think according to this they are still up and running as a facility i just imagine they maybe like hey because his decisions are so kind of left to center they maybe took him there and said oh we could film here he went yeah we could but with it playing itself. <laughs> yeah, actually, right. actually. yeah, and I mean, I don't, I don't know. You said, sort of, I'm thinking of the ending now, and, and you said that, you know, they said there can only be, there can be only one so many times that, you know, that didn't seem to have an impact. But again, like, I can see the director at the end of that movie going, you know what, we've said there can be only one a couple of times. Like, how do we make it important this time? Mm-hmm. Like, at, at the very end. And he solves it with that tracking shot and that sort of like echo or reverb effect in in his voice that they throw onto it that just makes it again work. Mm-hmm. It just works. Shouldn't like you? I look. I read that script. I'm like, yeah, we've said this enough times. This can't be like the big thing. What doesn't work is the ha ha ha. What kept you? That doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, but I want uh, to talk about the prize because there's a bit early on when Ramirez is training McLeod and he's so we know that Maria Ramirez has lived for like thousands of years whereas McLeod's only about 400 years old and he says to him when he's training him that if he got the prize it would you know damn humanity would all be destroyed and then at the end he obviously gets the prize and I originally remembered incorrectly that it just made him mortal and I'd forgotten all of the other stuff that came with it. Because like, she says, so Brenda says to him, world peace. well, kind of, but she says, well, you know, what, what is the prize? And he tries to describe it. And I'd forgotten that he says, you know, I can hear things. I can feel what people uh, are thinking in other parts of the world. I can try and help them and bring them together. And he suddenly realized in another universe where the Kurgan won, but, he becomes Lex yeah. Luthor. Which makes sense, yeah. given that Clancy Brown <laughs> was Lex Luthor in the animated DC stuff. <laughs> but I think as well, the, I, the more you feel that, it makes the ending almost biblical. But you've also got the scene of him almost on the crucifix when he's banished. Mm. I, yes, a Christ-like figure so, when you put him in the stocks. Yeah. yeah. And it, hey, hey, that, that banishing scene, yeah. that's another scene that really works much better than it should. Like the... The with him not because it's I mean it is harsh obviously what they're what they're doing to him but what is his friend uh, which one is it it's uh it's Angus uh, and Angus, Angus who yeah. protects him yeah who protects him who 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 stops the stoning and then just you know says can you walk out of here and there's that little moment where he says you know yeah I'll bloody well walk out of here and that's kind of funny and then he's and then he and then it becomes more earnest because like the weight of this actually falls on them and he and he says, I won't forget you. And, and instead of Angus saying something, there's just this, like, it's this close up shot. That's, it's a well constructed shot. And he just sort of nods and you just know, these guys are never going to see each other again. Mm. And, and this was the, this was the last like nice thing that he could do for his friend or his cousin or whatever they are. And, and it's, it's a scene that's like, it, Again, on the page, it's it's not that effective, but it gets elevated in the way that it's shot and in the costuming and with the music. And and I still find like whatever, however that look that exchange is between them, just feels very genuine to me. And there are those, it, there are enough of those moments in this movie that 
back burner some of the stuff that's silly and over the top and and ridiculous. Now, again, going back to the American version, the most over the top and ridiculous stuff got cut out of the American version. I think that if I had seen the European version, I don't think I would have become a big fan of this movie. Interesting. Um, like, like I think it's that because just enough of that stuff got cut that it changes the tone of this movie and it's much more consistent throughout that it is that it is an action fantasy sometimes drama that that doesn't always hold together real well so pete what are some of your favorite moments then from this gosh i think we've probably covered most of them we haven't talked much about their sword fighting which is very good Mm -hmm. But yeah, I th- do you know what? I think we've covered all the things that I really like. So the transitions are a big thing for me. But yeah, the emotional impact of um, of Heather of Heather dying is a big one. Yeah. And again, I think watching it when you're older, the all the kind of stuff about mortality and how important it is to be mortal almost is actually hits you much harder. Like you say, than the 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 kind of flashier bits would have done when I saw this the first time. Um, but it's very say for me now. I it was very weird at the time having seen the second one in the cinema and thought that was a bit shit. And then the person <laughs> I was with explaining to me what they'd changed very, very angrily, and I was like, well, "Why would you do that?" And then I literally the next day bought the VHS of this and went, "That was a brilliant film. I need to somehow scrub the sequel out of my mind uh, because yeah." The retcon thing doesn't make any sense. So there we are. Yeah, which which I've done. I mean, I saw that in the movie theater. I was very excited when it was coming out, and then and then it made me realize that I didn't need a sequel. But you know, you you mentioned Heather's uh, Heather's death, which I think is a really good scene. You know, the Who Wants to Live Forever, but the actual death scene again. Uh, Mulcahy does something, or the editor does something really interesting, which is as he is as she is dying and as they are having that conversation, they cut away from that room. Like they're zooming in on his face uh, as he's, and this is probably his best actual acting moment in the movie. And they cut away from him as they're zooming in and they have that tracking shot going up the mountain where he's, where she hasn't died yet, but he's clearly carrying her body to bury her Mm. up this mountain. And then they cut back to the the last line of dialogue, and then she just and then and she slumps over, and it's it's it so works, but it's weird. Like that shot should come after because she hasn't died yet, but it works so well that I don't know. Like the, like there are these decisions where I'm like, I don't know why you make that decision, but it was the right call. But it's weird. It's like you know, this is seen as quite a kind of schlocky kind of film, I guess. But that's the kind of thing that something like Soderbergh would do to, right. t- you know, to take a scene like that and, and make it non-linear. And it's like and it's also a beautiful moment, I think, when it ends on the sword that is used as a headstone. Which because right. yeah, at the very beginning of the film, it always baffled me originally. Like, why has he got a katana if he's Scottish? And then obviously you explains it with Ramirez and everything else, but. You never see him with the, the McLeod sword again, and that's why. And then you get to it. I like that they actually dovetail these things. It's like if you show, you know, they show something at the beginning, and then they go back and explain it, and everything hangs together really well. Right. I, I just and, like and, the bits. Yeah, and 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 it and it's not explained. That's what I like about it. It 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 very naturally occurs, and it makes perfect sense in the context of her dying. But when you think about it, you're like, oh yeah, well, okay, well that's why he doesn't have his sword. But so it so it's not put in there to explain it. That's that's a key, and that's and that's kind of why why I don't care for the like if the Rachel Nazi scene is in the movie or not. Like it's fine either way, but I kind of prefer it not because it 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 sort of brings the movie to a stop for me. But like you, but I think as well what you just said about him putting the sword well the sword being in the ground we don't see it put in the ground in a way is almost that's the end of that chapter of his life and you assume he's left yeah. Scotland and never gone back until the end of the film which makes it much more yeah. symbolic that he can love again and go back to the place that yeah. he couldn't return to oh and that's an inter- that's an interesting difference between the american and the european version too is at the at the very end and uh after he gets the prize and he's like about to go to sleep on the on the wet concrete there mm-hmm. and brenda comes over to him in your version there's no uh, there's no dialogue there. I don't think. And in the American version, he says he wants to go home. No, he doesn't say that. No, he just. Um, 
Just... What do you mean when he's just when he's got the quickening? You mean? I mean the gift? Yeah, yeah. He get, he gets the prize and then he drops to the ground and she comes over and she kind of holds him like kind of in her lap a little bit, right? Yeah. For a second. Yeah. Yeah. In your version, there's no dialogue there. She just kind of holds him and then it cuts and they're, and the, and they're yeah, like yeah. traveling That's through it, the yeah. highland. In the American version, he says to her like like he's like barely conscious or whatever, but he says, "I'd like to go home." Ah, okay, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. And it works either way. I mean, I'm not saying that this is not one of those things where I feel like the American version is definitely better, but um, it works either way. But I do think it's interesting that that one version has it and one version doesn't, and I don't I don't know why. It's not like it's poorly delivered. You know, it's, it's just as poorly delivered as everything else he says. <laughs> uh, I think of that shocking note, it's time to do some scores. <laughs> I think so, too. Son of a bitch. Enough with the yak at the yak. What is your score? So, so, so explain to me the scores, because okay. I feel like... You can only have a score of between one and five bags, five being the maximum, and there are no half bags. <laughs> no half bags. No. So, but 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 this isn't like this isn't like a. But the bags. Of the, let me make sure I understand this because the bags of action. It's not like this is not like a Roger Ebert review, right? This is not like this movie is expertly made and is very effective. It's like the bag of action is like it's like how much do you love this movie or enjoy it, yeah. right? For you it, as a film as a whole, with everything that's wrong and everything that's right about it, how good is it for you? I got it. Okay. So who goes first? Okay. As I guess, you can go first because you brought the film to us. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, I think you know, going back to what I said earlier, that, that this is a film that I have enjoyed and on multiple levels, mind you, because I'd like to think that I've matured in 30 years, since I was 10, 11, 12, whatever it was when I first saw it. I mean, and and I still... As long as I'm watching the American version, I can't actually get through the European version, I'm not going to lie. But as long as I'm watching the American version, like I can just sit down and watch. The, I've always been able to sit down and watch this movie, overlook whatever flaws. I'm not unaware of them, but they don't matter because they're so overshadowed by all the things that do work, especially the ones that shouldn't. The transitions are awesome. Like All of it works, and it's a fairly tight movie. And it works dramatically and as an action movie. So I honestly have to say it's one of my favorite movies ever. So it's it's a full five bags of action for me. Wow. Mm. Okay. Pete? Hello. Uh, so, <laughs> I, yeah, I again, it's very rare to watch a film that you've seen multiple times and still not quite better work out where the seed of the idea came from or lots of the decisions. And I think when I was younger, I probably thought of that as a weakness but the more we talked about it and the more having rewatched it, I think that the the disparate nature of all these things is actually a really big strength because there isn't really another film like it. The, the soundtrack is great and it, for the, all the right reasons. I love the fact that it's a film with its own law, but it doesn't, it, there is exposition in there, but it's not in a way that doesn't work within itself. It feels natural. Mm. Um, we've hardly talked actually about the relationship between Ramirez and McLeod, which I think is a really strong... I've, I've never seen uh, Sean Connery look quite so happy when he's in a film, really. He just beams it's through true. the whole of it. Yeah. Um, and you do buy... You know, I love, you know, as a lot of good action movies, there's a mentor, mentee, and the training uh, scenes, which is always good. And those scenes are really strong. And I think you do buy that relationship. And they do that really quickly. Because actually, Sean Connery has very little screen time in when you, when you lay it out in a line but is a really impactful kind of kind of character. So yeah, overall, um, I think some of the flaws still hold it back for me, but maybe it's because I haven't seen the American version. Uh, so with that in mind, I'm going to give it a very, very solid four bags. Mm, okay. Just on a slight aside on Sean Connery. Now, the, I remember he was in an interview I saw on YouTube from not, many years ago. Now, imagine he was going to be in The Matrix, remember? And I think oh, yeah. he was going to play the Oracle character, but no, he was he was going to play the um, I forget what the guys he was going to be in the second and third ones. I think I thought he was going to be in the he, first one as the Oracle because the re I know the reason they changed the character is because the actress originally died. But I know that he said he got a script, he read it, he couldn't make any sense of it, and he said no. I wonder now when he got Highlander. Did he kind of look at it and go, what the hell? And they kind of sat down and explained it to him. 
And then he went with it. Because he is, as you said, Pete, he's laughing, he's smiling, and you buy his relationship because it's just about him and a guy. The, all the other kind of fancy stuff and the you know the immortals and all that quickening stuff. He talks the talk. But it's like Sir Alec Guinness. He says, Oh God, this the dialogue they give me is terrible. I hate it. And you can now, if you go back and watch those films, you can see him talking through you know the, the terrible dialogue and thinking I'll get through this and I'll get my paycheck and I'll go home. <laughs> but I buy Sean Connery in this. I believe that he's having fun. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I, and, and we didn't talk about that relationship at all, but the relationship between them, I think, really does work and shouldn't. But again, it does. It just does. Yeah. Anyway, so my score, given everything we've talked about, all of the weird elements, all of the kind of comedy and and the missteps... It's been the many years since I've watched it. It's, it came out nearly, what, 30 years ago now? Getting on for that. Um, I didn't, 31 years ago. Yeah, I, I didn't think I was going to enjoy it as much. I thought I'd be bored. I thought the film would drag. And it, it really didn't. Every scene is important. The pace is there. There's, there's little moments that you could cut out. There's some silly moments that I would I would take out just for timing. But... It didn't drag for me, um, and I was surprised how much I enjoyed it um, compared to what I thought I was going to. I, I'm going to give it four bags simply because I think there are other films that are more powerful for me. This has a lot of memories for me. It takes me back in time, and there's other things I now pick up re-watching it now that I've just turned 40 as well. It's like Batman 66. I was talking to Scott about this last night, and we said, when he first saw it as a child, he just thought it was ridiculous, and then when he got older... As a teenager, you probably thought, well, it's just a load of fun. And then you get older again, you go, actually, this isn't a brilliant comedy. I understand it's a complete, complete pastiche. And this film has definitely changed with time for me. Now, uh, you know, I'm also looking at it and, and thinking about mortality and thinking buying buying a big sword. But uh, <laughs> it's just a really solid film that I could give to a 20-year-old now and go, Watch this. You might want to see it remade. You might think it's a bit hokey, but it's still a really good film. And I think they would enjoy it. Yeah. And I would, I'm going to go ahead and just tell you that if, if you guys hadn't been saddled with the European version, you'd have given it five bags of action as well. <laughs> maybe, maybe. But they still need to cut out that awful bit in the church. And then it might creep towards five. I, I will say, though, that, that you won on Blade Runner. Because the international cut of Blade Runner is way better than the American release was. Well, guys, thanks for thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate this. I appreciate thanks, you. Thanks for bringing uh, Highlander back. It's been a long time <laughs> that we since we've watched it. Um, so it was good to uh, to go through it again and, and be surprising for both of us how much we enjoyed it. You have been listening to Bags of Action. No bullshit. We'd better stick around for the next episode because if you're lying, I'll be back.